Grace friends and family. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us today at Grace. It's me, but you knew that. <laughs> hey, I just wanted to remind everybody, we have our Fall Festival and Trunk or Treat event that's coming up on Halloween, October 31st. Um, at the church, it's going to be a drive through Trunk or Treat with some uh, hands-free games and all kinds of fun uh, the team is going to be lighting up the church, and it will be a wonderful way for people in our community to have a safe Halloween experience, and oh, by the way, at church as well. So um, if you haven't already checked out the Fall Festival page at mygrace.church, please do that. We can use your help to create the decorations, to uh, bag the food that's going to be given away, all kinds of other ways to help. So please check that out at mygrace.church. And don't forget to invite your families to the Trunk or Treat event, neighbors, uh, kids from school. It's going to be a great way because a lot of places probably, a lot of homes probably won't be handing out candy this Halloween. So don't let the kids miss out. Join us at Grace. So a couple more things to announce this morning, folks. Um, first of all, if you were at Grace last Sunday, or if you're there today, hooray for you to worship together in person, albeit with the pre-recorded service for now. That'll change, just takes a little bit of time. Don't forget though to register for next Sunday service if you'd like to be there. We have limited seating available, 25 to 30 people in rooms one and two combined uh, to watch the service. So please don't forget to register ahead of time. And I also just wanted to mention that we do have um, a session of Grief Share that's coming up. I had mentioned it last week also. If you're interested in Grief Share, don't delay to sign up. Uh, part of the reason for that is that once you sign up, you will have um, an opportunity to receive directly from the Grief Share organization the workbook that helps you process through the grieving experience. So take a look at the Grief Share page at mygrace.church for information and how to sign up for that. And today, folks, um, please do give generously to help to impact those around us and the ministries here at Grace. You can give in many ways, as we've talked about before. You can give online at mygrace.church. You can text in your offering just right there from your phone. And you can also send a check in if you'd like to do that. And if you're there at Grace, feel free to drop an offering off in the box that's there for, you, for that purpose for you. So folks, we have another breezeway coming up at 11.30 today. Hope to see you there. God bless you. Here is our King, here is our love, here is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one he is Jesus. From wherever spring arrives to heal the ground. From wherever searching comes the look itself. A trace of what we're looking for to be quiet now and wait. The ocean is growing, the tide is coming in, here it is. Here is our King, here is our love, here is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one, He is Jesus, He is our King. He is our love, He is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one, He is Jesus. And what was said to the rose to make it unfold, was said to me here in my chest, so be quiet now and rest. The ocean is growing, the tide is coming, here it is, here is our 
King. Here is our love, here is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one, He is Jesus. He is our King, He is our love, He is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one, He is Jesus. Good morning and uh, welcome to Grace Community Church. So earlier this week, uh, Sherry and I had an opportunity to do something we've never done before, and that's to go sailing. Uh, we went sailing with uh, Jeff and Donna Bloomberg, and uh, it was out of San Diego, and it was a wonderful experience. So we were kind of puttering around San Diego Bay and a little bit of motor, a little bit of sail, and then we got out into the ocean. Uh, they turned off the motor and extended the sails and that wind out on the ocean caught that sail and you could hear that snap and the boat just kind of scooted forward. It was an amazing feeling and it reminded me of our very first message in the IT series that a person with IT has the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when you are carried by the Holy Spirit you feel that snap in your soul. And you just kind of feel yourself propelled forward like we did on that sailboat uh, last week. Uh, let me read to you from Acts chapter 2 what happened when the wind of the Holy Spirit came across the disciples and all those people that were gathered. Listen to these words. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roar, roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues or fire appeared and settled on each one of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And then it goes on and the Lord said that while they were there, all these people were gathered from Pentecost, from all different countries, different languages, and each one of them spoke to them in their own native tongue. That was that original uh, speaking in tongues that led people to hear the good news of Jesus for the very first time in their own tongue. And then at the end of the chapter, uh, verse 43, a deep sense of awe came over all of them. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. All of this while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and the Holy Spirit comes upon a church, everything changes. Let's continue our worship together now. A thousand stories of what they think you're like But I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone You're good it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Say a word. 
You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. God. 
my soul at rest. From Him comes my salvation. Holy God, maker of heaven and earth, sustainer and giver of life. God, we meet you in this place. God, we long to find you in the faces of those who we haven't seen. And yet, God, you meet us here. God, though we're far from our community, we feel the love that surrounds us and holds us up. But God, when we are here and we feel weak and we feel lowly, we feel afraid and the walls feel crushing, God, you long to sustain us. You long to meet us there. Father God, forgive us for not looking to you. God, forgive us for seeking out comfort from places that are not of you. God, forgive us for not being the light and salt that you've called us to be. God, in this time of political heightened awareness, as we're looking toward elections, God, help us to not push our agenda God, put, but to look to you for your agenda. God, would you challenge us in new ways as we're called to be your people? God, in the midst of it, we, we pause and we remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg. God, we thank you for her life and her legacy. God, we thank you for her servant heart. God, she fought for justice for all people. And we are so far from that. And yet she championed the cause. God, would you give comfort to those who loved her and cared for her? And would you give peace to our country? Father God, we pray for our families near and far, we pray for students who are in school and staff and teachers who are in school and all the unrest that comes with that. God, would you quiet that unrest? God, we pray for those in our community who are suffering and, and sad. God, who've experienced tremendous loss God, we pray for those who are sick and those who are hurting and unsure. God, would you heal them up and give them peace? And God, we pray too for those who are experiencing financial hardship. God, would you give them the courage to reach out to those who can help them? And God, would you give us generous hearts to give beyond what is comfortable. God, we thank you for our church. We're excited at the prospect of coming together. God, would you show us the way? And God, as we hear Pastor Duane's message, we pray that you would fill him up to overflowing. God, we thank you for his steadfastness and the way that he cares for your people. But more than that, God, we thank you that he is a servant of you, that he seeks you out and longs to share the good news message to all people. And God, would you provide him that strength to do it now? We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I had a dream.
Now, not as profound as Daniel in the Bible or Martin Luther King, but I had a dream nonetheless. It was several years ago, and our church leadership at Hope Covenant Church was discussing something fairly outrageous. We decided to do Easter at Tumbleweed Park in Chandler. Not a sunrise service or not some add-on service, but the Easter service at Tumbleweed Park, which meant we we're going to be closing the doors of our church on Easter Sunday. We decided that we wanted to take Easter to Chandler instead of inviting Chandler to come to Easter services. No one had ever done anything like that before, at least we couldn't find it in Chandler, and we decided that it was something we were willing to take a risk on, and we did. So here was my dream. It was Saturday night uh, before that Sunday service at Tumbleweed Park. Uh, everything was ready to go in my dream. Uh, we had this big, gigantic Easter egg hunt where we gave out 10,000 Easter eggs to all these kids in Chandler, and uh, we had enough food to feed 2,000 people, and these 2,000 people came and enjoyed their food, and then uh, the worship team got up on the stage and, and did their worship set, and after that, it was my time to get up on the platform. I stood before the pulpit, and nobody was there. Not a soul, not a person. The worship team behind me were looking around, and I stood up, and there was no one there. I later discovered that all of our people from Hope Covenant Church had, and all the other people in Chandler had gone to one of Cornerstone's 25 services, right, with, um, with a rock concert for their band, uh, with Disneyland for the children's ministry, and the special guest speaker was Kurt Warner. Okay, so me or Kurt Warner. I would have gone to Cornerstone Church as well, but no one showed up. Well, that was my dream. Now, it was because I was really anxious about doing this risky thing. It was costing us a lot of money. There was quite a few people in our church that thought it was a really bad idea, so we had that kind of controversy going on. Uh, there were naysayers. We needed 150 volunteers. Our reputation was on the, on the block. I mean, it was really something. But we did it, and God blessed it. I'll, I'll never forget, we, as I said, we had 150 volunteers. Many of them came at 6 a.m. to set up the stage and to set up these 1,000 th chairs in the pavilion. And after we were done, uh, I ran home to, uh, it, we only live five minutes away, I, I went home to get dressed and came back. Uh, the service was supposed to start at 10 o'clock. Uh, the Easter egg hunt was starting at 9 o'clock. I came back about 8.30, and when I got there, I was absolutely shocked. There were people coming from every parking lot, all through this huge center, and they were coming down all these sidewalks, and I thought to myself, where are all these people going? And then I realized that they were coming to our service. And indeed, we had all these kids for the Easter egg hunt. We fed over 2,000 people breakfast. And then we had our service, and there were over 1,000 people listening to the service. More about that in a moment. But we need to understand what it means to be, as a Christ follower, a risk taker. And as a church, Grace Community Church, a church that takes risks, not risks like jumping off a cliff, risks to figure out ways to reach our community for Jesus Christ, risks that say, I will do anything short of sin to reach one more person for Jesus. That's what this it message is about today, taking risks. So let's review where we've been. Uh, the first Sunday was about um, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that in our greeting. Uh, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in an individual's life and in the life of a church. The second week was about this passion for the presence of Jesus. This absolute desire, this overwhelming feeling that we need to be with Jesus, just like Peter experienced. 
We need to be in the presence of Jesus. Uh, we need to recognize that if we want the way, if we want the truth, if we want the life, if we want the bread of life, if we want the resurrection, that all of those things Jesus said, I am it. It is me, a, res- a kind of a, 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 a personal intimate relationship with Jesus, a passion for his presence. And then the third it characteristic we looked at was sincere integrity, walking straight and standing tall, having our insides match our outsides, matching our hearts, matching our hands. No masks, no duplicity, having an undivided heart. That was sincere integrity. And then uh, two weeks ago, down-to-earth humility. We looked at Micah 6, verse 8. To walk humbly with your God. What does that mean? It means to bend a knee to Jesus. Not bend a knee to politicians. Not bending a knee to the government. Not bending a knee to money or wealth or power. But bending a knee to Jesus. And then last week we talked about spirit-filled faith. And James, the brother of Jesus, wrote in his book these words, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. We looked at dead faith and living faith. Dead faith was, if you recall, zombie faith. It was, it was Pharisee faith. It was faith that is seen on the outside as being alive, but there is something dead on the inside. And living faith is seen by three things we looked at. It's seen by, it's seen by this presence of the Holy Spirit within us. Uh, Paul said it this way, the Spirit of God that lives in me is alive in me. And we looked at it as a conviction of the Holy Spirit in us, convicts us of our sin. But the most important trait of living faith is fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, fruit that is born in our life when we are alive on the inside. Now today, a person who has it, a church that has it, takes risks. The history of the early church, especially the first 300 years of the church, where the church had zero leverage, they had no educational or political or financial leverage of any sort, And the church made an impact that literally changed the world. And they did it by taking risks all the time. Peter and Paul and John especially were imprisoned constantly. They were beaten. Paul was shipwrecked. All these things happened. They took all of these risks and they kept coming back to the gospel of Jesus Christ and declaring it boldly for all of their lives. One of the things that happened in the early uh, Christian churches, uh, because of the Roman uh, Empire and the Roman belief that uh, patria potestas, the father, the dad, had complete power over his family, including power over his wife and power over his children. If they had, an unbo- if they had a, a child that was born that was defective in any way, or if they had a girl and they didn't want a girl, they would take these babies down to the riverside and leave them there for the animals to come and consume. The early Christians, when they saw this happen, they would sneak down at night. They would take these babies that were deformed or not wanted. They would take them and they would raise them as their own. That's just one way that the early church took a risk for the kingdom of God. The New Testament church was a risk taking church. Now there's a wonderful parable uh, that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25. And it's uh, the parable of the Uh, talents or the parable of the three servants. And as I read this, you'll recognize it as, you've probably heard many sermons on this uh, passage, and uh, most of them had to do with money. And most of them had to do with how that you're supposed to give your money to the church. Nothing wrong with that. The church needs money, of course. But this parable is not so much about money or talents. It's a parable about taking risks. Listen to these words in Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. 
He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities Then he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used this money. The servant to whom he had entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest. I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Verse 22. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Now the third servant, right? Verse 24. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, uh, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. Immediately, he's blaming the, the, the master, right? I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back with a big smile. Here, here's the, here's the 100 uh, uh, coins of silver. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And at the end of that passage, I go, ouch, right? I mean, the talents, the abilities, the things God has given us to use them for the kingdom, even risk them for the kingdom. The two did a very good job. The third did not. So this man goes on a journey. He distributes his property. And in modern pre-inflation dollars, uh, that would have been, the, the money that we're talking about would have been like a million dollars, $400,000, and $200,000. So we're talking about a big investment. Now the first guy invests his million and gets another million, quite honestly, making Warren Buffett look like an intern at E.F. Hutton, right? And then the 400 turned it into 800, and the last one incredibly hide, hit it in a coffee can, buries it, and waits. Now this last guy is so risk adverse that he is afraid he'll lose the cash and there'll be consequences. The master's reaction will not be good, which it wasn't. He was paralyzed by fear. I wonder if any of you have ever been paralyzed by fear. What is someone going to think? What's going to happen if I do this? This man opted not to opt. He chose not to choose. He simply does nothing. And then Jesus says, you wicked, lazy servant. And that seems pretty harsh. It seems like the punishment doesn't match the crime. Why is the master so upset? Because the servant is unwilling to take a risk. He played it safe. He didn't want to take responsibility if something went wrong. I mean, if you have something valuable, we use it. We invest it. We share it. But this guy was so risk adverse. He was afraid that something would go wrong. Now, Jesus was not only speaking to individuals like you and I. He was speaking to the church. He was speaking to the religious establishment of Jesus' day who played everything safe. They did exactly what their forefathers did. They did exactly what their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers did. They were risk adverse. They never changed anything. So this parable is not really about money as much as it is about risk. So let me give you some rules for a safe church. Now, when I say these, 
I hope that Grace Community Church is never going to be a safe church. But here are qualities of a safe church. The first thing is this. Strive to keep members happy. Okay? Guard what you have. Strive to make members happy. You know what? Uh, one of the things, the tenets of the Evangelical Covenant Church is what the old Swedes used to ask each other. Where is it written? In other words, where from Scripture do you get that truth? And the idea that God has made us so and he just wants to make us happy and that's his goal in life? No, not in Scripture. He doesn't desire so much to make us happy, but to make us holy. He not so much desires to make us comfortable, but to build our character. So strive to keep members happy. First rule of a safe church. The second quality of a safe church is avoid controversial issues. Never preach on things that are difficult. Never talk about things that are weird that we find that we can't agree on. Avoid controversial issues. In other words, don't upset anyone. Make sure everybody is happy and smiling and being nice to each other. And then the third quality of a safe church is to guard the status quo. Play it safe. So um, my first church was Mount McGill Covenant Church in Spring Valley, California, a suburb of San Diego. Uh, Sherry and I both grew up in San Diego, so we were thrilled to come back there where our parents were and relatives, and it was really cool. In fact, this church that I came back to was the exact same church that I had served as a youth pastor from 1972 to 1974. Then I went to North Park Theological Seminary, graduated in 1978, and that same church called me back as the lead pastor, something that hardly any churches ever do because people still see you as the youth guy, right? So anyway, I came back as the pastor, and after a few years, our church was really growing, and there was some great ministry going on. The people were awesome, were amazing. But we did notice something in the early to mid part of the 1980s. The community around the church was changing pretty rapidly. A lot of young Hispanic families were moving into our area. And they were beautiful people, and we got to know them. But many of them could not speak English. So we thought, you know what? Um, we want to minister to these people. We don't speak, we're, I mean, our services are in English. What should we do? We had, at that time, two or three services. What should we do? So I met with Marlon Enns, who was a retired missionary from Ecuador. And uh, he spoke fluent Spanish, and he agreed to my scheme. He said, let's start a church Sunday afternoon. Don't charge anybody a penny. Certainly, we'll take an offering if we, if we you know, just because that's what you do in churches, right? You take an offering. And, and Marlon said, I'll, do the, I'll be the pastor. I'll lead the church. I'll do the preaching. I'll do everything, and it'll be amazing. We'll really reach our community for Jesus in this way. So we were excited. We took this plan to the elders, and we were all fired up. And at the end of the meeting, the elders said, no. It's going to cost us money. These people really aren't going to pay, for, pay their own way. It's going to be harder on our facilities. We're going to have all these people, kids running around and everything. And after that meeting, I went home and told Sherry, I said, I need to look for a different church. Because this church will not take a risk. This church will not do what it takes to reach one more for Jesus. A risk adverse church. Now, let me tell you why this matters so much. If you had a cure for cancer or for AIDS, and you knew 100% it, it would work, and it would eradicate cancer and eradicate AIDS, if you kept that to yourself and didn't share that with anyone else, wouldn't be, that be a terrible crime? Or how about this? Let's say that you had the ability in our world to produce, you know, you've seen those bumper stickers, world peace. No, world peace. You have the ability, the knowledge to make our world, the world has never experienced peace. There has always been wars going on in our world every second of the last 10,000 years. It's always there. But you had the ability to work, but you kept it to yourself. Or let's say that you had the ability to completely wipe out every trace of racism. 
Everybody that has light colored skin would see people with darker colored skin in exactly the same way as children of God, loved and adored by God. There would be no racism. We'd wipe out the last 400 years of our abuse of people with darker colored skin. We'd wipe out our abuse of taking, bringing slaves from Africa. We would wipe out our abuse of American Indians and the way that we said, just no, go over there, leave us alone, you go over. We would wipe all that out and the world would have no racism. If you had that ability and kept it to yourself, what a terrible thing that would be. Or how about this? What if you had what the Bible calls the pearl of great price? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel that has transformed you. And let's say you had that knowledge and that ability to tell people that they can be Lead, be led from, from death to life, from darkness to light, from hell to eternity with God. And you decided to keep this to yourself because your religion is too personal for you or that's too kind of embarrassing for me to share that with someone else. If any of these scenarios were true, we would have to say to each other, and I even hate to use this word, we would have to say, shame on me and shame on the church if we keep this to ourselves. Every time we take a risk, it's going to cost. So let me finish that story about Easter at Tumbleweed Park. So in reality, I did wake up from that terrible nightmare and God did bless that service and we had a thousand people there. And remember, our church at that time was only about 500. So we had 500 other people, and besides some of our people did go to Cornerstone, so we had more than 500 people. We, so we had all of these people there. And at the close of the service, we gave an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. And 35 people came forward and said yes to Jesus for the very first time. And many of those people are still in the church today. After the service, we had this little kiosk where our prayer partners were there and they were giving out uh, literature to those who had said yes to Jesus. And the line to that was this long line. That line was longer than the food line was. Uh, the line was longer than the line to get into the, the Easter egg hunt. Uh, and people were anxious to hear the good news of Jesus. So yes, it was risky. And yes, not everybody agreed with it. And yes, the Holy Spirit led us to do something that made a difference for the kingdom. So let me share with you some realities of a church that takes risks. Now at this point, I want to say to you, now we're, we're, we're gathering uh, on Sunday in our rooms over here. So I want the leaders of those rooms to lock the doors and at home, you lock the doors because I don't want you sneaking out during this next part. This is not going to feel very good. Here's the realities of a church that takes risks. The very first reality is this. Pain. Okay? Aren't you glad you came to Grace Community Church today? Right? Ask little Johnny what he learned in church today. Oh, I learned that the church is going to be painful. Right? That's awesome. So let me read to you from John chapter 15, uh, verses 18 and 19. Listen to these words. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it. And I would say parenthetically, but you don't. If you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Again, I'm so glad you came to Grace Community Church today to learn that the world is going to hate you. Doesn't that sound exciting? The world's going to hate you. Now, in Jesus' day, uh, women had no place. Jesus changed that completely. Jesus said, there is no male or female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Je uh, women's liberation in 1973 uh, did not change women's status. Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Now, the fact that we haven't obeyed that or done that or lived that, that's on us. But Jesus changed that 2,000 years ago. How about uh, slaves? Slaves, <laughs> in the book of Philemon, in the book of 1 Timothy, Paul says, hey, you're exactly the same. 
You know, in Christ, you're all the same. Whether you're free or slaves, you're all the same. Okay, there's no slavery. There's none of that, right? And how about this? Your enemies, the people around you that hate you, that have hurt you, your enemies, you're supposed to love them. And how about this? Children who have no authority, no power, no leverage whatsoever, children are to be adored and to be protected and to be kept safe. All of those things were the reality of the first century. And Jesus changed all of those things. And because the church has always been kind of going against culture, kind of the opposite direction, culture says women have no place, children have no place, slaves are real, and uh, you know, all of these, and the, and the church is going against that. We have always been in a place of hatred. I mean, all you have to do is look on television and you see how, how, how much ridicule there is of the church, of Christ followers. Now, quite honestly, Part of that is on us because we've done a terrible job of communicating the gospel of Jesus with love. We've done it with condemnation. We've done it with a bullhorn. We've done it with a fist in the air. None of that is valid. It's always done with love. It is going to be painful going against the stream of the culture. The church is not supposed to be a safe place. The church is supposed to be a dangerous place. A place where we get ready to put on our armor and to do battle and to go out into the world with the good news of Jesus and share that even though people hate us. So I was at my second church after I left, left Mount McGill in 1985. I was called to uh, uh, Lakewood Covenant Church in Lakewood, Colorado. When I met with their search team, I made it very clear that uh, my heart and my goal is to reach lost people for Jesus. Yes, I want to take care of the people in the church. Yes, I want to make sure that they're happy and they're well-fed and they're getting good Bible study and all that. But quite honestly, most Christians are overfed anyway. Okay, they're just overstuffed, right? So I said, but really what I want is to find ways to get out in the community and reach them for Jesus. And the search team said, yeah, that's great. What the search team didn't tell me is that the elders didn't buy into that so much. So we had a little bit of a deal. So uh, after about a year at that church, um, uh, one of the elders came to me and said, now, Dwayne, um, you know, we love you. Okay, anytime they, an elder wants to meet with you alone and say they love you first, you're in trouble. Okay, so uh, we love you, but um, all these new people that are coming to church, these aren't our people. I mean, these are people that are less than economically. Some of them are addicted. Some of them uh, are still sinning. And I, I wanted to say, his name was Don. I wanted to say, Don, well, so are you. You just don't say it out loud. Uh, but, and, and, and these are, this is not our, this is not what we really want. Uh, can you preach a little bit less on commitment and a little bit less on evangelism and a little bit more about how good everything can be? And I said, no, I can't do that. Now, to the church's credit, the rest of the elders, we had a meeting about that and they agreed, nope, nope, Don, you're out. Dwayne stays. We're going to do it this way. But here's the deal. Even believers don't want to take risks. Even believers want to play it safe. Take it easy. Jesus did not live and die so that we can be safe and happy. Let me say that again. And some of you may disagree with that. That's okay. Jesus did not live and die so that we could be safe and happy. A church that has it, a person that has it, is a dangerous person, a risky person, an edgy person. Now, here's another passage of scripture I want to read to you from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And um, believe me, this is going to hurt. This will leave a mark. Okay, listen to these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses of life of faith, this is after chapter 11 of Hebrews that talks about Abraham and Sarah and all the people of faith. And so we have this great crowd of witnesses. In the NIV, it says a great cloud of witnesses. All these people are around us, and we thank God for these witnesses and their testimony. Uh, let us strip off, because of that, this crowd of witnesses of life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. He's using this uh, track and field metaphor. So take off all the strip of weight uh, that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And you're saying, what sin so easily trips us up? And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. 
We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Oh, so that's the thing that we don't want to do is take our eyes off of Jesus. That's what the writer of Hebrews would say, yeah. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him, awaiting Jesus, and the joy awaiting you and me, that's eternity with God. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated the place of honor beside God's throne. It's going to be hard. And there's going to be pain. Now we may not be experienced like Jesus did, where he was beaten and flogged and stripped and chastised and ultimately crucified. We may not experience that, but there will be pain when we're going upstream. There is risks to where the world says, I don't like you. I don't like your faith. I don't like that you're so narrow that you say that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Don't shoot the messenger. I didn't say that. Jesus did. If you have a problem with a narrow faith, you talk to Jesus. Don't talk to me. The joy that's set before you. If you hang on and you will receive that, but in the meantime, it's going to hurt and there will be pain. When we started the Hope Church back in 2000, uh, my young associate and I, Brad, we, I've, I've told you this before, we talked about um, what the church should look like. And we came up with this simple phrase, let's have a church that looks like Jesus. Now, what that meant to us is that that's kind of warm and fuzzy. You know, Jesus' love and grace and warmth and all those good things. But what we discovered that when Jesus said, I, you know, come and follow me, that means to take up our cross. That means sometimes to suffer pain, to suffer ridicule, to suffer experiencing all kinds of things that the world doesn't like about us and puts on us. But we decided that this is the church that we want to be. Now, if you have it, if you want it, it will cost there will be pain, but there is one other risk. And you probably say, okay, finally, we get to the good news. Okay, the third risk is this, or the second risk is this, failure, okay? Now you're really excited, right? Failure. Peter walked on water, and he failed. Peter had the, his feet washed by Jesus, and he failed. Jesus threw, or Peter drew his sword and cut off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. He failed. I mean, Jesus said, dude, now I got to put this ear back on. Come on, you know, get with it. Peter denied Jesus three times in the courtyard, one time to a middle school girl. Peter hid and wept because of his sin. Peter three times was confronted by Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Then feed my sheep. And this man who failed over and over and over again was what Jesus called the rock, Cephas. He said, I will build my church on you. If you have failed in your life, and I know you have, I have failed many, many times. The problem is not the failure. The problem is failing to get back up. Every time Peter failed, he got up and said, Lord, here I am again. I'm sorry I failed you. I'm sorry I did this, but here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm with you. I'm in your presence. I want to do whatever you want, ask me to do. Well, how do you know if you should take a risk? Risk is always tied to the possible return, right? Okay, so what's an example of that? Uh, a burning house. Would you run back into the burning house to save your cat? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> One person. Okay. I wouldn't, Cheryl. God bless you. I would never do that. Now, if in that burning house there's one of my children, yes. I'm going, I could die, but I'm going in, okay? So the reward was worth the risk, okay? Now, unfortunately, some of my history is about gambling. And if I were to gamble $100 at the blackjack table and risk getting $200 or losing $100, I would take that risk. Um, or 
$500. I never did that kind of a bet, but I know a lot of people that do. Or how about $1,000? Would you take that risk? If you would, you need to go to Gamblers Anonymous. Okay, I'm telling you that right now. But return helps to determine the risk. So how about this? Um, I'm going to share my love for Jesus with my friend. I'm anxious about it. I'm nervous. I think I'll get my words all tangled up. I don't know what to do. Maybe she'll think I'm a weird religious person. Maybe she'll stop being my friend. Maybe she won't give me a brownie. I mean, all these things are going to go in your head. And you say, I, I, Lord, I want to share. Because the pearl of great price is in me. And I'm not going to hold on to it. I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm going to share it with somebody else. So yes, that takes a risk. And I'm kind of embarrassed and I don't know what to do. But I am going to do it. Whenever God gives me an opportunity to share my love for Jesus, I'm going to do it. It'll take a risk. I'll be seen as a, a religious weirdo, but I'm going to do it. Let me give you a, a little heads up. In a couple of weeks, we're going to open up our church and have people back in here on Sunday. Uh, no more than 50. We'll have social distance and we'll have masks on, the whole deal. But we're going to be together and it's going to feel so good. How about this? How about inviting a friend to come to church with you? Okay? Now, uh, normally I don't give magic bullets, but here's a magic bullet. It's one thing to say, hey, come visit our church sometime. That's nice. It's generic. It's easy. Nobody's going to think you're weird by doing that. But here's where it gets risky. I want to invite you to my church. And I want you, here's the magic bullet, I want you to come sit with me. Six feet apart, but I want you to come sit with me. I'll pick you up. Go to breakfast before service or lunch afterwards. I'll pick you up. I want to invite you to come to church. See what I'm talking about. When you recognize this pearl of great price that's in you, and you are not going to put, be the one that has, uh, you know, a, a basket over your candle. You're not going to be the one that hides. You're going to be the one that shares the good. It's going to be risky and painful and sometimes weird. And the world will think you're doing a bad thing and all of that. But the pearl of great price is real. And you know it. And you will share it with people that you love. Return helps determine the risk. When I was 18 years old, I've, I think I've told you the story before. My grandfather was dying of Parkinson's disease. And uh, all of our family went to church together. All of our family proclaim, uh, uh, proclaimed Christ as their Lord and Savior, except for Grandpa Price. He said, nope, that's not for me. That's for women and, women and children. That's not for me. So Grandpa is at El Cajon Valley Hospital, and he's dying. He's just got a few days to live love. And the Holy Spirit convicts me. Go and tell your grandpa one more time about Jesus. He said, me? I'm the shyest kid in our family. My sisters are all very outgoing. I'm very shy. Why me? Why not Judy or Joyce or Colleen? Let them do it. No, I want you to do it. So I screw up my courage. I go to the hospital. I say to grandpa, and I'm stumbling with my words. I don't know what I'm saying because I really respected my grandpa. He was, he was one of my heroes. I say, grandpa, I just want to tell you about Jesus. Can I read you a couple of verses from the Bible? He said, go ahead. And I did. And when I finished, I stumbled around. I said, grandpa, before you die, would you like to pray and ask Jesus to come into your life? He said, sure. And I almost fell over. And he prayed and he received Christ. And um, I was willing to take that risk. For my grandpa's sake, I, I was willing to take that risk. I, I didn't really care if he thought I was a, a nerd or a religious freak uh, because the pearl of great price in me demanded that I share that with someone else. So we planted a church in 2007 from Hope. It was called the Bridge Church. In fact, that's the very church that I was the transition pastor of for a year before I started here. So I was the transition pastor at the Bridge all of 2019. And, um, but that church cost our church, Hope Covenant Church. Uh, we had about 35 or 40 people, uh, many of them tithers and leaders in our church, that went to start that church. There was kind of this hole in our church, and we, we felt it. And uh, not only that, uh, taking away those people and their giving, uh, in addition to that, we were giving like $3,000 a month to the bridge to get it started. 
and we were loaning them musicians and we were loaning them teachers and there was this constant flow of people and, and we used to think, man, this is really costly. Is this, God, is this really what you want? I mean, we're trying to build something great here at Hope and you want us to take a piece away and that's, God said, that's exactly what I want to do. And the return for that is that hundreds of people since then have come to Jesus at the bridge, that the church is a healthy church that's doing really good work. Was the risk worth it? Absolutely. I mean, one of our mantras at our church was risk, failure, learn, adjust, right? In fact, say that with me, wherever you are at home. Risk, failure, learn, adjust. Risk, failure, learn, adjust. As long as there is one person lost without Christ, we will do anything short of sin to share Jesus with them. So are you feeling good about it? Risk equals pain, it equals failure. And here's the last thing, because you need a three-point sermon. The last thing is this, loss. <laughs> and you probably say, hallelujah, you know, loss, right? To lose yourself. Listen to Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. To lose your life for the sake of that pearl of great price, to say, I surrender my life completely, wholly, totally to Jesus. It's like that guy, his name was, um, his name was uh, Steve. He had just recently come out of jail. This was back at Hope. And he'd come to our men's study. He'd given his heart to Jesus. On a Sunday, we did baptisms. Um, uh, we had people lined up to give their testimony of their baptisms. And then I, I said at the end of that, I said, hey, if there's anybody else that, here that wants to be baptized, uh, now's the time. Steve jumps out of his seat. He comes up. He jumps into the tub, splashes a wave of water on me standing next to it. He's got his phone in his pocket, his wallet. He's got everything, his tattoos. Everything goes under the water. All of him, all of me, I surrender. I lose my life to gain Jesus. So there you have it. A life in Christ is a life of risks, including pain and failure and loss. The Lord Jesus said, I bid you come and die. I want to close with this. Um, when I was a youth pastor at Mount McGill Covenant Church from 72 to 74, the pastor of that church was Don Sands and a wonderful man of God. He was probably in his late 50s at the time that I was there as a youth pastor. And just about six months into my uh, being there as the youth pastor, uh, Don uh, was diagnosed with uh, a brain tumor that was inoperable and was spreading quickly. He was losing his facility faculties. He was losing his balance. He was losing all kinds of things. And he had to resign from the church. And I remember going on a long walk with Don one time. It's so one thing he could do is walk. And I said, Don, I am so sorry. You're one of the wonder, most wonderful men I've ever known that loves God. And I'm so sorry that this pain is in your life and that you're going to miss out on seeing your daughters maybe get married and have children. And I'm so sorry for all that. I'll never forget what Don said. He said, Dwayne, this is my life. I said yes to Jesus when I was a boy. When I was a young man, I said yes to the ministry. And every moment of every day of my life, I've had the privilege of having that pearl of great price, the gospel in me. I've had the privilege of sharing that with other people. The pain I've experienced, the loss, it's nothing compared to that. And if God says now is the time to take me home, then I'm ready to go home. Paul said, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, um, sometimes we open the word and we find words and passages that are scary and that um, we don't want to hear or believe. And sometimes, Father, we embrace those words and we recognize that in that place, we find our Savior. Our Savior who took all kinds of risks, who constantly risked his life, 
who constantly experienced pain and failure and loss. And yet he did it for the joy. The writer of Hebrews says the joy that was to come. And part of that joy that was to come was living in each and every individual life who has said yes to him. So Father, my prayer this morning is that each of our listeners would respond to this message with that one strong yes. Whatever it takes, whatever you ask me to do, wherever I go, because this gospel that is alive within me must be shared with the world so that they too can experience the joy that is to come. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Sin and 
One of our traditions at Grace Community Church is to receive the Lord's Supper uh, each Sunday. Uh, we do that because of Paul's admonition in the Bible that uh, as often as we meet, we're to break bread together. And uh, so we'd like to do that this morning. Uh, if you're in your home or someplace where you can go to a kitchen and get some elements, bread or crackers, some juice, uh, something to use for the Lord's Supper, uh, God will anoint that and use that. Um, communion is about offering ourselves to God and offering ourselves to each other. And so on the night that when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is given to you. Take and eat. In the same way, after Jesus had taken the bread, he took also the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink ye all of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Father, for these gifts, we are truly grateful. May we recognize that being part of you and you being part of us means that taking a risk for the kingdom is one of the most wonderful gifts that you have given us. Help us, Father, to live out our faith daily by giving you all. We pray in Jesus' name. thank you for taking a risk uh, to join us for worship today. I pray that uh, you'll come back and join us once again. Uh, now I just would like to encourage you that in a few moments we're going to be having our breezeway at 1130. Uh, it'll be great to see your faces on Zoom. So join us for that and uh, we can have a time to share together. And now receive the benediction. As therefore you have now received Christ Jesus the Lord, so live in him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.